Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar, Finance, Energy and Food Intersections in Southeast Asia's Green Transition, organized by the Climate Change in Southeast Asia program at ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. I'm Jia Hui, your MC for today. In this webinar, we will be listening to presentations from three distinguished speakers on green transitions in the energy, food and finance sectors in Southeast Asia, including lessons we can take away from past experiences as well as new challenges on the horizon. Before we begin, please allow me to draw your attention to a few housekeeping matters. Firstly, if you encounter any technical issues, please use the chat function to reach out to our technical support team. Secondly, to ask questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A function, stating your name and affiliation together with your question. You can send in your questions at any time during the panel discussion. Lastly, if you would like to stay informed on our program's activities, do sign up for updates at the URL bit.ly slash ccseap mail mail, uh, which you can also find the link in the chat box. Thank you for your cooperation. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for the session. Ms. Sharon Xia is Senior Fellow and Coordinator at the Climate Change in Southeast Asia Programme and ASEAN Study Centre here at ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. I will now invite Sharon to begin the webinar. Sharon, please. Thank you, Jia Hui. And a very warm welcome and good afternoon to our um, audience tuning in from all parts of Southeast Asia and as far afield as um, Europe and Japan. And um, in fact, I saw someone from the US, but it would be 3 a.m. right now. But if you're online, a very good morning to you. Um, Welcome and uh, thank you for coming for this um, webinar. So we thought that by putting together this webinar, um, we will have an opportunity to discuss the various intersections between the three topics uh, on green transition in Southeast Asia. And I think uh, it'll be a very rich discussion because in fact, public support for a greener economy is actually gaining momentum in Southeast Asia. Um, you have seen in the holding slides earlier that we do a climate survey. It's called the Southeast Asia Climate Outlook Survey. And in the last edition in 2022, more than 68% of Southeast Asian respondents tell us that their governments should be directing their economic recovery spending to a green transition. Why? Because more than 7 in 10 Southeast Asians fear that climate change impacts will negatively affect them in the next 10 years if they are not already suffering from it. And we know from reports that every year Southeast Asia takes front row seats in the climate catastrophe that's unfolding. Um, countries like Philippines and Vietnam constantly suffer from um, typhoons, cyclones, there's flooding and risk of sea level rise, and the list goes on. So there's uh, uh, an imperative to act now. Um, and also in this topic of a green transition, we see evidence of ASEAN collaborating with major powers such as the US, the EU and China to increase the level of green finance and investments into the region. And there's been interest by different multilateral groupings like the G7 to do more uh, to encourage a rapid transition using the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investments, uh, GPII, and also um, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships that were announced last year for Indonesia and Vietnam. And under the G20 presidency of Indonesia and now the Indian presidency, there's been much uh, attention focused on climate finance issues. Um, and even the Quad, a minilateral grouping, has also picked climate change as an area of cooperation for this region. So we see the kind of momentum that's really building up. And it's undeniable that investments in renewable energy um, is essential to the promotion of a climate resilient economy. And investments in renewables in ASEAN, uh, as the IEA has estimated, will need around 2.5 US trillion of investments in energy supply by 2040 to reach the kind of rapid transition that we're talking about. But expansions of renewable energy projects have potential adverse effects as well on food security, on people's livelihoods, on communities. And without you know, necessary and timely policy interventions to promote social justice and a fairer distribution of economic benefits, we fear that the green economic transition in Southeast Asia may fail to advance inclusive and sustainable development in the region, which is very key because the region is still a developing re region. 
and any transition should not um, widen that gulf um, between you know uh, those most vulnerable groups and and those who are benefiting from it. So without much further ado, I want to introduce the speakers. And after the introduction, we'll take a photo together so that this can all you know go on social media because if you're not on social media, you have not actually e existed. You have not. This hasn't taken place. Um, the first speaker will be Dr. Prapim Panchyang Kun. She is the assistant professor at the Faculty of Political Science at Tamasat University in Thailand. And she is also our associate fellow with the Climate Change and Southeast Asia program. And she has been working during her time with us on uh, climate and, and food uh, security as well as agriculture intersections. She specializes in the political economy of development. And uh, she has published uh, books with uh, Rutledge and Paul Grave, as well as articles in the Third World Quarterly and Alternatives, Global Local um, Political. The next speaker is Dr. Julia Del Masso. She's the Marie Curie Fellow at the Department of Asian and North African Studies, Carl Foscari University of Venice. And she's also at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore, uh, which is right next door to us. Um, she has been working on finance issues and her new project um, looks at the development of Chinese-led green finance along the Belt and Road Initiative. She has also published widely in various journals. Our last speaker, is our very own Dr. Siwage Dama Negara. He's a senior fellow at ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. He's also co-coordinator for the Indonesia Studies Program and the coordinator for the Singapore APEC Study Center at this institute. Um, his research interests are wide ranging, including the digital economy, infrastructural investments, food security, and energy transition with a special focus on Indonesia. And I know that he has just very recently done an excellent podcast on Indonesia's uh, Jet P. Um, he's also very widely published. And uh, with that, can I get everyone to just smile at the camera so we take a virtual photograph? I think this should be it. And then uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Pan to start off on the discussions. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. My presentation today will be based on a research that I've started last year as a visiting research fellow at ICS. But um, in the introduction slide, I will draw a little bit on some materials from my previous research at Tamasat University. Okay, so as Sharon has discussed, I think that in Southeast Asia, there is definitely growing interest to tackle climate change and to promote a greener economy. And many countries have been collaborating with major powers to increase green finance and investment in the region. And later in this webinar, you will hear from my colleagues who will discuss in particular the Belt and Road Initiative and the Just Energy Transition Partnership. Now, like many people in the region, I do not think that it is in the best interest of Southeast Asian countries to shoot sides in the ongoing geopolitical tensions between the US and China. And in my previous research before joining ISIS, I argue that geopolitical rivalry and competing infrastructural initiatives have actually increased the bargaining power of smaller countries, including in Southeast Asia, uh, where development opportunities have now increased. But it is uncertain whether Southeast Asian governments will fully take advantage of this opportunity to promote green transition, and if so, to what extent. Okay, let me point out that um, ultimately, this is fundamentally um, a political issue because whether a Southeast Asian government supports green transition or not, depends on the strength of civil society groups and political movements in that country, and also the extent to which they put pressure on the government to support a green and just transition. 
I also want to argue here that attracting external finance and support for renewable energy investment is only one part of the story. Um, and that Southeast Asians should ask some difficult questions about what types of green investments are being prioritized and who will benefit or be adversely affected by renewable energy transition. In addition to that, um, Southeast Asians should be more proactive in framing the discussions about just transition and green economies rather than let national elites or other major powers decide what energy transition and green economies are supposed to look like. In the following parts of my presentation, I will discuss how rapid expansions of renewable energy could potentially undermine food security and also as a foundation to help support a strong and progressive green civil society. I will propose that the conceptualization of just transition be extended to include the interconnections between climate change, energy transition, and agri-food systems, and that just transition should be seen as part of a broader attempt to promote a more equitable and climate resilient economy. Through this perspective, um, I want to highlight that just transitions in the energy and agri-food sectors are not merely technical issues or goals that can be achieved by simply throwing in a lot of money or you know, by using high-tech innovations. So in the last part of my presentation, I will also propose that policymakers should consider social justice and distributions of economic benefits when promoting renewable energy transition. And this also means that green investments should be embedded in socio-environmental goals. But before we get to the details, um, let me briefly discuss the interconnections between climate change, energy transition, and food security. So on the one hand, many studies have suggested that climate change has and will continue to have adverse effects on food and water security. On the other hand, our current agri-food system or how we produce, transport, and consume agri-food products relies a lot on fossil fuels, and so it is a major contributor to climate change. What this suggests is that as the effects of climate change become more apparent, achieving food security in Southeast Asia is going to be a much more challenging task. However, this doesn't mean that um, we should simply increase the quantity of major food crop crops by any means necessary. Um, and this is because there's also a pressing need to transform our agri-food system to both mitigate and adapt to climate change and to also promote biodiversity and long-term ecological sustainability. And obviously we need to uh, speed up renewable energy transition but it is well established that um, many forms of renewable energy have rather large land footprints. And this means that the expansion of renewable energy compete with agri-food production for land and water resources. And in many cases, the, the competitions for these resources can lead to social conflicts. In Southeast Asia, um, renewable energy projects such as hydropower dams and biomass plants have um, often caused um, adverse consequences. Um, land use changes involved could, for example, undermine biodiversity, increase competition for water usage, dispossess farmers off of their lands, and cut off local communities' access to common lands where they used to gather food and fuels from. And many people are concerned, for example, how hydropower dams in the Mekong River will reduce the variety and quantity of fishes in the river, uh, which are the main sources of protein intakes for the local populations in the area. And in the next presentation, my colleague Julia will also discuss how the floating solar project at Sirinton Hydropower Dam in Thailand is built upon decades-long unresolved social conflicts with um, the local populations. Another issue to consider is the consequences of the mining of critical minerals um, that are needed in the production of renewable technologies. In Indonesia, Myanmar, the Philippines, and Thailand, uh, for example, 
um, these are the countries that are rich in critical minerals, such as bauxite, nickel, and tin. Um, and so if we do not have rigorous environmental and social impact assessments, um, increased mining of these minerals could harm the environment and local communities or also contaminate food production, food production areas. Additionally, um, in one of the ICS perspective pieces that I wrote last year, I discussed the um, consequences of biofuel production in Southeast Asia. Countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand are now major producers of biofuels and their renewable energy development plans rely significantly on biofuels that are derived from food crops, such as sugarcane and oil palm. Um, the problem is that increased demands for these food crops could drive up food prices and hence undermine food security. In addition to that, uh, the increase in the profitability of energy crop farming has also led to an increase in large-scale land acquisitions, and that often lead to violence and social conflicts in Southeast Asia. So, Given the food energy connections, um, I propose that the conceptualization of dust energy transition be extended to include the effects of renewable energy expansion on land use, food security, and other adverse consequences on the local populations. Um, because like, usually when we talk about policies to promote dust transitions, we tend to just focus on policy to help compensate or retrain workers in the fossil fuel industries and perhaps policies to create decent jobs in the green sectors. But if rapid expansion of renewable energy by any means necessary, aggravate hunger and impoverish a large number of people, then obviously that process can hardly be called just energy transition. I think it is fair to say that uh, in Southeast Asia, policymakers encourage green investments based on conventional way of thinking. Um, they might be centrally concerned with how these investments can contribute to energy security and economic growth, but are less concerned with social justice and inequality. Countries such as Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia, for example, are uh, aiming to become major producers of electric vehicles in, in hope to economically benefit from the global shift towards greener economies. Um, and of course, a lot of actors um, involved in the energy transition process are thinking of ways to make money out of the green transition. However, uh, we should not forget that climate change is a serious existential threat, not just a new opportunity to make profits. And studies in ecological economics and critical political economy have suggested that the ways in which we currently organize our economic activities are major factors that lead to the present ecological unsustainability crisis in the first place. So in this era of climate emergency, I think it is clear that we can no longer adopt a business as usual approach and that fundamentally new ways of thinking about economic development are needed. There are many other people who have written on this issue, and I'm also developing my thoughts, but um, in this last opinion piece that I wrote for Fulcrum, I made some preliminary suggestions that uh, to promote a climate resilient economy, Southeast Asia should move away from gross domestic products or GDP as a measure of economic development because um, it doesn't capture sustainability or people's well-being. I also suggest that um, inequality reduction can significantly help to tackle climate change and support energy transition. And although I did not go into detail, I tried to discuss um, a little bit how there should be some reforms of global economic governance as well. So in summary, what I am suggesting here is that instead of using energy transitions to stimulate GDP growth, um, just transition should form a part of new economic models that prioritize human development and the achievement of universal access to basic needs, such as food and energy. 
And there are likely to be significant political resistance from those who lose economic benefits, but I believe we can make strong ethical and economic arguments that in the long run, a more equitable and green economy will benefit everyone in the society. And that's why it is a development path that we should all support. So I do realize that my proposals are very far from, from current thinking and practice in Southeast Asia. Uh, in Thailand, for example, the, the government still adopts conventional thinking as reflected in the case of Thailand 4.0 and foreign investments in renewable energy that uh, my colleague will, will discuss in the next presentation. Um, but I'm, I would argue that changes in people's economic common sense need to start from somewhere. And the way we think about just energy and food transition is a good place to start. Okay, now let me discuss some policy implications based on this extended conceptualization of just transition. So to a certain extent, I do agree that just transition requires technological solutions such as to reduce the land footprints of renewable energy and to reduce adverse socio-environmental consequences in the agri-food and mining sectors. Um, however, I propose that Southeast Asian policymakers should go beyond the technical aspects to also consider social justice and distribution of economic benefits when they design policies to support energy transition. For a broad policy guideline, um, I propose that Benjamin Sovacool's 4E processes can be quite useful and it is also easy to, to understand. Uh, for example, um, in the planning of a new renewable energy project, uh, one should take into account enclosure or what resources are being captured, exclusion, who are being excluded from the decision-making process, encroachment, you know, what environmental damage will occur, and entrenchment whether the projects will exacerbate inequalities. And after looking at the four E's involved, appropriate measures can then be taken, such as to include relevant stakeholders who were previously excluded, or to find ways to compensate those who are adversely affected, or identify other ways to address negative consequences. With regards to competing land use, uh, we should also make sure that large-scale land acquisitions do not violate customary land rights and that there are peaceful resolutions to land conflicts. Additionally, I want to propose that uh, more green investment should be directed towards the promotion of human development and the achievement of universal access to basic needs in the region. Um, this means that priority should also be given to um, investments in climate resilient agriculture not just in renewable energy and green technologies. And ideally, um, wherever possible, green investments and um, other forms of support should be designed in ways that promote social justice and income redistribution. Let me go into a bit more detail here. In another one of my ISIS perspective piece published last year, I discuss how agroecology and sustainable agriculture methods can be used to increase climate resilience in agri-food production and that Southeast Asian policymakers and other actors should not only focus on high-tech solutions in agriculture, but to also provide support to smaller actors. In particular, I discuss how sustainable farmer groups in Southeast Asia have been developing sustainable agricultural practices and green market channels for decades, and that these valuable contributions can help us to reflect on how to promote sustainable agriculture on a larger scale. And to be clear, I am not advocating going back to traditional forms of agriculture but to seriously utilize um, modern agroecological science, low-cost technologies, and socially embedded market channels in ways that will benefit smaller actors as well as bigger players in the agri-food sector. And recently, I also wrote another um, perspective piece that explores the use of renewable energy by rural farming groups 
and also the use of agrivoltaic systems where solar panels are integrated with farmlands to minimize the land footprints. Um, in addition to a review of their technical potentials, I also try to highlight socioeconomic considerations in the analysis. For example, I question whether the higher costs of renewable technologies will increase farm household debt. And I also draw on examples from other countries outside of Southeast Asia to show how agrivoltaic projects can be used to uh, support social goals, such as to promote food security and energy access for low income households. Or perhaps these projects can be organized as energy cooperatives that share profits among members. So overall, these are just some of the examples of what we could be looking at if we want to embed uh, progressive social goals in green investments and green economic policies generally. Okay, uh, so due to the time limit, um, I'm, I cannot explain some arguments and issues in detail, but most of the points I made here can be found in some of my writings for ICS, or perhaps we can discuss some issues further during Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Pan. I want to now invite Dr. Uh, Julia to make your presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes, uh, but you have to go into full screen. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, well, first of all, thanks so much for um, inviting me to this seminar. Um, and the uh, Prapim Pam presentation was uh, really great in setting, I, I, I think, the argument um for this debate uh, um uh, she provided a great overview on the complexity of energy transition and really uh in depth and much uh, needed reflection i think so today i'm going to be um to present uh, um some pre preliminary findings of my recent field work in thailand and uh, this is really uh, part of a larger project um, which adopts a, an anthropological and a critical geography perspective to look at the deployment of green finance, Chinese-led green finance along the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and so uh, the rationale of, of the project I'm working on, it's really uh, to test and, and examine uh, the way they often uh, described as abstract world of finance really lands on the ground and so intersect with the building of material infrastructure. Um, and so what you'll see, what we'll hear uh, from my presentation is really um, the result of um, in-depth analysis of like a case uh, by case infrastructural project, uh, which, as I say, adopts an anthropological lens. So first of all, let me give you uh, an overview of what green finance is. Um, so uh, globally, what has been defined as green climate and sustainable finance uh, really has been promoted as the solution that, uh, so the main solution that government and international institutions have chosen to tackle the climate crisis. Um, Clean finance, green finance has really embedded environmental policies into the wider process of financialization of capitalism. Uh, and it really promises to tackle um, the problem of climate change 
while continuing to guarantee future return, so economic profit. Uh, China is emerging as one of green finance leaders in the global scenario, and despite being responsible for most emissions in the world, it is also the country investing more funds in the energy transition, promoting practices of green lending, renewable energy technology, and so on. And so China was one of the first countries in the world to release its own catalog, which is a taxonomy for green investment, which then before the EU even and, and the US. Um, in the last five year plan, there is a clear explicit reference to green development and green transition. And the new Belt and Road Guideline uh, explicitly appealed to the idea of ecological civilization, Shanghai Wenming, to really define the activities of private and state-owned enterprises engaged in overseas projects and to, so to integrate environmental considerations in their operations. Uh, and really committing to greening the Belt and Road as also emerges a way to respond to the general uh, Belt and Road uh, kind of um, investment uh, slowdown uh, due to, to, to the lower return associated with the economic uncertainty, um, especially related to the COVID pandemic in the last few years. So my fieldwork uh, um, in Thailand uh, uh, looked at uh, um, Chinese green finance um, focus on uh, energy and transportation uh, as major sectors. And it really looked at the way uh, Chinese investment has been a you know, engage in, in, in Southeast Asia, which is one of the region of the Belt and Road, receiving really more investment diversification uh, in renewable energy. And this includes solar, wind, and technology for electric vehicle. And really China is playing a big role in reconfiguring Southeast Asian different power production and energy policies. Um, so my fieldwork in Thailand started exploring the way Chinese influence and investments intersect with new, uh, with a new restructuring policy Thailand is undertaking under the 4.0 vision. Uh, this was advanced by the Thai government, the military junta that took power uh, with the 2014 coup. And it was launched in 2016 with the aims of creating uh, a new economic model that would revive the country economic status after a previous economic phases. And so to, to, to move the country out of the low middle income trap. And this really focused on a, a value uh, based economy, um, which was then coupled uh, with the energy 4.0 vision that also include green uh, uh, finance, smart investment, and, and a focus on renewable um, technologies. And so in this context, the Thai government uh, um, institutionalized a feed-in tariff regime. Uh, this is a politic mechanism offering special prices and long-term contract to renewable energy producer. Thailand Central Bank is working on its um, on its own green taxonomy and is now involving climate stress testing. Uh, Thailand launched a carbon credit market to become a carbon trading hub in Southeast Asia. Uh, here, big emitters uh, uh, will be able to offset their carbon footprint uh, by purchasing credit from company. Uh, um, and here it should be noted that Thai, the, uh, 
Thai main public utility company, IGAT, uh, is one of the only uh, company that so far has been allowed to uh, issue renewable uh, certificates in, in Thai carbon market. Um, so this uh, ambitious uh, economic restructuring uh, also see the promotion of a special strategy uh, in the form of an economic corridor. Um, the Eastern Economic Corridor uh, Development Plan in Thailand has been, developed, has been developed by the government to foster uh, foreign and domestic actors um, involvement, attract investment and build infrastructure to increase connectivity in the area. Uh, the area of the corridor historically hosted the Utapao uh, military base, which was a key military site during the Vietnam War and then during the Cold War. And, and afterward, this area became like a logistical hub for industrial production, mainly dominated by Japanese and American investment that then, in a way, capitalized on previously existing uh, military infrastructure. Uh, in the last few years, however, um, and so in discontinuity with this past, China has started to emerge as a major actor. And what really stands out in the various projects of the corridor is the creation of a Sinotai industrial park. So the, the Sinotai Rayong industrial park, which I visited, and this is a zone which explicitly connects and refers to the Belter Road. Uh, it offers uh, multiple tax exemption, exemption to Chinese enterprise. It also offers the possibility of land ownership to Chinese company, companies, which is otherwise um, very uh, rare. And so in the global renewable energy landscape, the Sinotai Industrial Park uh, is really becoming an important site for the global production of solar technology. Um, and this, of course, has not only favor uh, Thailand's ambition to build a renewable, a renewable energy uh, future by guaranteeing the availability of Chinese cheap solar technology in-house. It has also offered Chinese manufacturers a production site to, in a way, you know, bypass American sanction on their products and components. And so by visiting uh, the park, I found that four of the major Chinese uh, PV solar producer manufacture and assemble their product in Rayong. And so this, uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, Sinotai, uh, cooperation and the deployment of Chinese solar technology is visible in one of Thailand recently constructed flagship project, which is the construction of the largest solar floating platform in the world. And this is a solar farm covering the, the same area as something like 70 football pitches. Um, which was built on the reservoir of Sirindon Dam in northern East Thailand. And the project claims to be the first uh, um, and, and the largest of this, of, of this kind, matching a hybrid solar hydro uh, energy supply by day and night. And the dam was financed by Thai Public Utility, IGAT, in partnership with Energy China as constructed and Thai uh, German uh, company, Big Rim. And so through this consortium, IGAT is then planning to build uh, solar floating farms on the top of other um, dams, reservoir across Thailand and Laos. So it's a model which is 
uh, which will be reproduced. Mm, this project uh, expect to generate returns in various ways, uh, not only by selling electricity to the local government, but also selling carbon credit uh, through um, a now uh, Thailand uh, carbon credit market, which I just mentioned, and IGAT is the main uh, renewable energy certificate years, but also through the issue of, of green bonds and Big Green um, is also issuing green uh, bonds and, and the Asian development bond is playing um, investor uh, project. And so the solar kind of solar floating project con con configure in the form of an infrastructure on the top of another infrastructure where new technology provides a kind of a new layer to provide, to generate future income and almost a, a new cosmetic layer to a, a kind of an outdated and, and now uh, heavily critis criticized infrastructures as, as hydro, as uh, the previous presentation uh, pointed out. Um, so, Sirindo Hydro Power Dam, as many other dams, uh, carries a history of conflict that lasts until today. Uh, the dam was originally built in 1971 by IGAT, uh, thanks to loans provided by the World Bank under American influence uh, in the Cold War context. And as other dams in the region, um, it kind of carried a uh, geopolitical purpose. Uh, from 1965 until 1983, there was a guerrilla war in Thailand between the Communist Party of Thailand and the government of Thailand. And that, and that time, um, well, American infrastructure carried uh, uh, specific geopolitical goals, no, but the, the containment of, of global communism under a, a kind of paraded uh, techno power. Um, and so Sirindom Dam uh, had, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, caused uh, land dispossession, unemployment, irrigation problems and biodiversity laws. Uh, protest uh, began by the affected villager in the 70s. Uh, they continued in the 90s uh, when the assembly of the poor, which is a grassroots social movement, very active in the role, the whole region was established and was established also thanks to the Serindom Dam displaced villagers. And until today, protests continue to seek fair compensation for the dam and, 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 and argue that the dam uh, floodgate, floodgate uh, should remain open. Uh, and a few months ago, uh, while I was there, protested had camped for a week in front of Egan, and they were still claiming for compensation after more than, than, than 50 years. And so, in a way, they 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 hope to leverage on the fact that the dam was on the global spotlight for that uh, solar project uh, uh, promoted everywhere as as a virtuous uh, green infrastructure. And so here, just as some uh, concluding remark, uh, Chinese led uh, green finance engagement in Thailand seems to intersect with existing power hierarchies and policies that enable form of capital extraction and accumulation. And this is shown by Thailand 4.0 and strategies, special strategies like the Eastern Economic Corridor. Uh, states here play a key role in the development of legal system, industrial policy, public-private partnership that allow the building of green infrastructure and thus enable future revenue stream through uh, uh, green finance instrument. 
but in so doing, they also enhance process of uneven development and concentration of power as um, uh, Pam previous work has underlined. Uh, the new green finance apparatus and Russian renewable in Southeast Asia seems to organize around and give rise to political alignment that retraced post uh, geopolitical and, and geoeconomic rivalry, but they also shape new one. And this, in a way, happens through the uh, parade neutrality of financial instrument. Uh, that promises to deliver clean uh, and green future income stream. Um, but the power infrastructure I've shown really, in a way, calls to reflect on the relationship between green finance and, and what anthropologists Dominic Boyer and geography Tom, Timothy Mitchell call the messiness of uh, energo power. And despite often masked by green technical and development discourses, green finance and re its rhetoric seek to silence uh, past uh, um, injustice and local struggle. Uh, but the good news is, as this case study has shown, is that uh, it is also reviving new action from below as the mobilization of local community uh, claiming for their lands uh, and right as shown. Uh, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia. That's a lot to, to chew on and so much information that we have to go over later in the discussion. Um, and now I invite um, Pak Wage to deliver your presentation. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, it's a okay. full screen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and good morning uh, for those of you who join from the other part of this region. And yeah, I think I have uh, received this uh, very challenging topic to present uh, on the energy transition program. Uh, this is a pertinent and timely uh, topic, but at the same time, we all know that this is a big and complex topic to cover. So within the next uh, 15 minutes, I'm trying to provide some macro policy view on the challenges and also outlook of Indonesia Energy Transition Program. So uh, in my presentation, I will uh, uh, start with this, uh, the the plans, what is currently on the uh, government plans on energy transition. And then the, I will uh, discuss about government policy. And after that, we'll also uh, give some uh, uh, highlight about what are the public, Indonesian public perceptions on this energy transition. And then after that, we'll uh, talk about the challenges with regard to the, the the program and also uh, on the prospect outlook of this uh, implementation. So uh, what is in the plans? Uh, as we know that Indonesia has committed to reduce its greenhouse gas emission by 29% uh, with its own effort, uh, so by 2030. And then uh, the country also committed to achieve net zero carbon emission by 2060. And then Indonesia also has the target to increase the shares of renewable energy from the current uh, level of 12% to 23% by 2025, then uh, increase further to 32% by 2030, and then 69% uh, by 2060. So uh, Indonesia has a, a plan to phase out it's a coal-fired power plants by 2050. And then at the same time, the country also thinking about early retirement of uh, one third of the current coal-fired power plants. 
And uh, Indonesia uh, has also another uh, programs to support the uh, energy transition through the use of biodiesel and then uh, the promotion or the development of electric vehicle. Uh, the country uh, also plans to launch the national carbon market by 2025. And uh, finally, uh, there's a, a program to accelerate the development of the coal downstream industry. So uh, this is to uh, in, improve the uh, efficiency of uh, the coal industry and uh, reduce the emission. So uh, what are the government policies to support this uh, uh, energy transition? Uh, last year, Indonesia uh, passed this pres presidential regulation number uh, 112, uh, 2022, to accelerate the development of renewable energy for the provision of electricity. So uh, in this uh, regulation, uh, there is uh, the decision that the Indonesia will not uh, construct a new uh, coal-fired power plant, but there's a condition that uh, there's some exception that in some industry, strategic industry, or in a certain sector that related to the uh, mineral processing, uh, the government still allow this uh, develop, uh, the use of coal-fired power plant. And then currently the parliament and the government uh, are discussing about the renewable energy law. This is the, the foundation for the, uh, the program for renewable energy under just energy transition program. And uh, currently like uh, we are all waiting for the completion of this uh, important law. So the 2021-2020 uh, 30 electricity supply business plan is also an important uh, document, policy document that uh, prioritize the use of renewable energy resources. And in this document, we, we see that uh, the, a key to the Indonesia's green transitions are uh, hydropower and solar uh, power. So in this uh, plan, uh, Indonesia uh, will develop more hydropower uh, at the level of 10, uh, 10 gigawatt and uh, for almost 5 gigawatt for uh, hydropower and solar power uh, respectively. So in 2021, uh, the government already uh, allowed the uh, foreign direct investment in renewable power generation and distribution. So 100% for foreign investment in this area. Uh, previously, it was an, in the negative uh, list, but now it is uh, included in the positive uh, uh, list for FDI. And then uh, government also uh, give more subsidies for renewable energies with uh, the condition of uh, fulfilling some local content requirements. So those are the current uh, policies and regulation under the government, uh, Indonesian government to support the uh, energy transition. So uh, we did a survey uh, last year. Uh, this is a nationwide survey covering uh, more than 1,600 respondents. So we asked about their perceptions on uh, energy transition. And uh, we see that in general, the public are very supportive to energy transition. So when we ask the question whether they think that Indonesia must reduce the use of coal, oil and natural gas for the sake of environment, 53% of the respondents agree that uh, yeah, this is the right way to go. And then uh, when we ask about whether Indonesia must use cleaner energy sources like solar, wind, hydropower, and geothermal, 70% of the respondents agree that we, we need to choose the cleaner energy sources. But what is interesting is that uh, when we ask question uh, whether government should keep fuel subsidies to support the poor, 80% of the respondents said that they support this uh, fuel subsidies program. So uh, it seems like there's a contradiction at the, uh, on one hand that the public wants to, uh, in Indonesia to join the programs of uh, energy transition, but at the same time, they also want the government to keep this fuel subsidies program for 
supporting their uh, life, uh, the well-being of the people. So this uh, will become a, a policy challenge later on for Indonesia and uh, any energy transition program needs to consider about this public perception. And uh, let me show you some statistics about the uh, in energy sector in Indonesia. And uh, you can see here that the uh, electricity sector, the, the graph on the left, uh, the blue color, is actually the uh, biggest contributor for CO2 emission uh, in recent years. And we know that uh, this is in line with Indonesia's uh, push for development of uh, electricity generation uh, since uh, 20, uh, 2010. Uh, so what happened is that when uh, Indonesia built more coal fired power plants, then uh, at the same time, uh, we also produce a lot of uh, CO2 emission. And at, at this uh, moment, uh, the, the electric, at that time, the electricity uh, production was uh, planned to, to fulfill the demand. And that uh, the demand was uh, projected based on the assumption that the economy will grow uh, about uh, uh, about five percent to from five to seven percent growth. So what happened is that uh, nobody knows that there, there there was a pandemic that affect the uh, the electricity demand in the country, and uh, we can see that uh, the electricity generation the the, the production has been uh, consistently above the demand. So uh, currently, Indonesia have an oversurplus of uh, electricity uh, production. Uh, so this is uh, the thing that uh, quite uh, challenging for the uh, state-owned electricity company, uh, given that they need to make sure that the the electric electricity uh, supply can be uh, channeled, and also. Uh, uh, providing the room to uh, for renewable energy to come in. So in, in the next, uh, I think, a uh, few years, then the state-owned enterprise uh, in the electricity company needs to think about how to deal with the electricity oversupply and then also how to generate this uh, demand for, for electricity from renewable energy. Uh, then uh, we see that Indonesia will continue to rely on coal as a key energy supply in the next uh, uh, few years. This is uh, because uh, if we look at the uh, current electricity uh, plan of the state-owned electricity company or PLN uh, for the next uh, uh, 10 years, the government is targeting about 40 gigawatt for power capacity. And uh, we see that the composition in this electricity generation uh, still uh, dominated by coal and gas. And the re renewable capacity uh, is uh, estimated to be about uh, 19 gigawatt. So um, there's a challenge how to uh, shift from coal dependency to uh, more renewable and energy uh, uh, sources. So uh, the information from the Ministry of uh, Coordinating Economic Affairs uh, shows that Indonesia needs fund, a lot of fund to uh, basically compensate for the coal phase out until 2029 in the range from 9.5 billion to 25.7 billion US dollar. So. Uh, I think uh, this is the the big uh, big challenge for the government and also the, all the stakeholders how to get this uh, funding to uh, to expedite the uh, phase phasing out of coal fired power plant. And and if we look at the subsidies, uh, I think in recent years we see that the uh, increase in energy prices. Uh, including like uh, oil, gas, and coal, that that actually have uh, an implication to the energy subsidies in Indonesia. And uh, for 
for PLN, the state-owned electricity, they face the problem that uh, now they uh, they, they need to uh, secure the the supply of coal in in domestic for domestic use. Given that the the high energy uh, the high coal prices internationally and the low price domestic uh, in uh, domestic price that uh, makes the incentive for coal uh, mining to sell to PLN becomes uh, relatively low. So there's an issue with this. Uh, uh, coal supply, but uh, the government then provide this uh, policy for domestic uh, market obligation for the uh, coal mining companies to uh, uh, provide sufficient supply for electricity uh, consumption. But uh, the point that I would like to make here is that uh, given the higher energy prices internationally, so uh, Indonesia will have to uh, uh, prepare for increase in terms of energy subsidies if the government continue to maintain the lower energy prices in the domestic market then it means that it needs to be ready to pay more subsidies for uh, supporting these uh, low uh, energy prices and we can see that the the pressure on uh, fiscal uh, space has been uh, quite significant since last year. And yeah, I think at, at the moment, uh, the government is thinking about how to better target this energy subsidy. So uh, another challenge that Indonesia face in terms of energy transition is that the, the price for energy transition is not uh, cheap. So Indonesia needs to find financing to support especially the uh, energy and transportation sector. So this, this table comes from the uh, uh, second biennial update report on, and roadmap of nationally determined uh, contribution mitigation uh, 2022. So in that document, it is mentioned uh, that uh, in order to achieve the emission reduction target, Indonesia needs about uh, 250 billion uh, in the energy and transportation sector to support this, uh, the energy transition or the uh, decarbonization in the energy and transportation sector. And how can this uh, uh, be achieved? How can we, uh, Indonesia, get this financing? Then uh, this is uh, currently under I think the the discussion within the government and also international community, uh, the government has already uh, talked to the multilateral financing organization like ADB and World Bank, and there's a, a program or so-called energy transition mechanism to support this uh, phasing out of coal. And then uh, Indonesia is also preparing for programs uh, to be funded by Just Energy Transition Program. And uh, yeah, I think we, those are still under negotiation and under uh, preparation. So we, we still need to wait and see how, uh, how uh, Indonesia can uh, quickly come up with these uh, uh, concrete plans how to to uh, basically reduce this uh, emission in the energy and transportation sector. So on the outlook and uh, yeah, this, uh, I think for, for the time being, uh, given the vested interest in the sector, especially in the uh, coal uh, and uh, oil and gas sector, uh, we should expect that gradual changes are more likely than revolutionary one. So uh, it doesn't mean that we uh, cannot be optimistic, uh, but uh, given that Indonesia is uh, going into uh, a political year, an election year next year, so there will be a change in government and we need to make sure that there will be a continuation from the current government to the next government about their commitment for uh, yeah, pushing for energy transition and achieving the uh, climate target that uh, the current government has already 
uh, committed. So government uh, needs to create this uh, clear regulation and a clear uh, law to, to provide incentive for renewable energy uh, players to come in and invest. So uh, this means also that uh, the government needs to gradually shift the fossil fuel subsidies to renewable energy investment and R&D. I think in this uh, area, uh, we may need to think about the possibility to link this renewable energy investment and R&D with this uh, just energy transition mechanism or uh, this uh, energy transition mechanism program, whether this uh, kind of uh, blended financing, loan financing can also support the R&D and investment in uh, phasing out of uh, fossil fuel. So uh, we also need to in the participation of private sector that uh, uh, will be very important to push for renewable energy development. And uh, for this, uh, there will be a need to adjust the current business model in the energy sector. In Indonesia, I think the, the energy sector is uh, very dominated by uh, the state-owned energy companies like Pertamina and PLN. So the, the, the two largest uh, owner and operator of renewable energy. So with the uh, increase in terms of participation of private sectors, then uh, there's a need to, to adjust the business model, how to make the private sector become small, uh, kind of uh, uh, give them more incentive to enter the, the sector. And last, I uh, think the energy transition, uh, as already mentioned by the two uh, speakers, will affect the local communities, workers, and also the industry. So uh, there's a need to manage this social and economic, also political costs of the transition program. And uh, yeah, I think uh, for the just energy transition, again, uh, the aspect, there, there are many aspects that we still don't know, or what are the costs uh, to the society and uh, yeah, I think to the environment, I think we, we also need to uh, have more study on that uh, area. So I think I will stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wage. And I invite all our speakers back on the screen. When we conceived of this webinar, we knew we were being ambitious, but I, I think we really have a lot to unpack and we might, this could even become a full day's workshop really in discussing all of the issues. And I see now uh, many questions have started coming in uh, through to the, to the Q&A. Thank you very much. And if possible, when asking those questions, please uh, state which institution you are from so that and, and which speaker that you would like to direct the questions to. Um, so I'm going to take uh, now the, uh, actually one of the questions is coming from Indonesia, um, but he has not stated which, which speaker he wants to direct this to. Perhaps maybe all the speakers can take this question. Uh, it's a question on the impact of uh, ESG applications uh, to really to the business bottom line and whether it's going to have any impact on the company's uh, cost and the use of capital uh, when, you know, I, I assume that the question also relates to how um, um, governments may, may require um, companies to make their own ESG reports and so on and how that's going to impact bottom line. Um, would, would any of the speakers like to take this up? Maybe Pan? Because this question came quite early um, during your presentation, I think. Okay, so um, I haven't done research on ESG, so I would um, rather not answer. But I mean, if there's anyone else who would like to answer, please go ahead. Uh, maybe I can just um, say... Um something related with what ESG is in the sense that it's ESG reflect the ambition of really translating some, uh, you know, issue of your know, 
climate risk into financial risk, which is part of also a broader uh, uh, picture that we are um, witnessing with green finance. But the trans this ambitious translation of how climate risk really uh, impact on uh, financial activity, um, it very much depends on regulation, as Sharon was saying, but also on, on what kind of third party verifier are put in place. Uh, um and and so how you know this this kind of assessment are undertaken thank you yeah actually uh, for us the esg arena is a very complicated uh, and complex one and also it is at risk of a lot of greenwashing so the kind of research that you can do in the area of esg is um, really highly contested um, the next question is actually for Dr. Prapin Pan. Um, in, and in fact, it wants to talk about, um, you know, framing the just energy transition uh, across the different sectorals, which is what we're really trying to do in, in this webinar by discussing you know, everything that uh, affects energy from agriculture to, to, and to finance and so on. And um, he says that um, this is Maxentius Bambodo who says that, you know, in the short run, the transition may actually see certain trade-offs, but it could be beneficial in the future. And therefore, he thinks that, you know, the provision of compensation uh, will be important, but will it actually work to attain the kind of fair transition, especially for the poor? Um, I think this is a question maybe directed at uh, Prapin Pan, and also part of Julia's presentation uh, has touched upon you know, the, the assembly of the poor in Thailand um, um, seeking uh, compensation and seeking redress for the conflicts that's happened. Okay, so um, thank you for the, the question about um, fair compensation. So um, I think we probably need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, but off the top of my head, I think that... Um, to have fair compensation, we should um, at least make sure that these two conditions are met. Um, the first one is that um, those who are adversely affected somehow have a say or a representative in the body or the, the committee that um, decides the, the nature or the amount of compensation. And that is an issue that keeps coming up again and again. Um, you know, like in my research on Thailand 4.0 a few years ago, um, a lot of the, the programs that were supposed to be helpful to the, the local populations actually did not really involve their um, participations. Um, and the second condition, I think, is that um, as the result of the compensation, those who are adversely affected were not materially worst off or you know, um, at least they should be able to maintain that uh, livelihood somehow. So I realize that this is quite vague but because um, the, the nature of the, the negative effects can vary right, from, from case to case. So I just, I'm just giving like a broad guideline here. Thank you. Um, the next question is actually about, um, you know, how in your presentation, Pan, you talked about the kind of competition for uh, certain resources like land, uh, water, and how in this uh, rush towards a green transition, some of these priorities need to be um, discussed more broadly perhaps, because in, in pushing for one aspect of the transition, you may be neglecting uh, another aspect. And the next question is really actually about whether um, the use of, for instance, nuclear energy, could it significantly reduce the need, uh, the, the land use conflict uh, between food and, and energy production? What are your views on that? Okay, again, thank you for the, the question. Um, so I take this question to be mainly about, you know, whether I support nuclear power or not to reduce um, land footprints. So let me just... Um, give a very direct answer that I do not 
support nuclear power. Um, and I'm not sure I even see it as renewable energy. And, you know, I'm not claiming to be an, an expert on nuclear power here. But um, personally, you know, in addition to concerns about accidents and the effects on health and, and the environment and so on, um, I think most people, sometimes they tend to forget that we, um, you know, uh, we get a lot of radioactive waste, waste from the nuclear power plants, and these can actually take up a lot of space to store. And if these wastes um, get leaked somehow, um, then that could cause um, a re really very, very long-term negative consequences, not to only to people's health or to the environment, you know, damage um, food security as well and um, caused a lot of um, intergenerational injustices. And um, I believe I also read somewhere that um, you need to find um, proper or like appropriate locations to build uh, nuclear power plants so that they're not too, uh, you know, too, too dangerous. Um, so that there will be very limited space where you can build it. And also um, it, it needs a lot of um, water as well in its operation. So overall, I think um, you know, we, we need to investigate this issue very, very carefully. Uh, another question is actually um, from Maxentius again for Julia. Um, the promotion of uh, renewable energy in Thailand via Chinese BRI projects you've shown that there's some acceptance of these projects in Thailand and in Rayong district, for, for instance. But how effective have such, you know, the critical voices, the protests from people on the ground uh, been? Have they actually effected any change towards the projects? Has it, um, has it resulted in a, a project design change, for instance, as a result of these uh, protests? Um, uh, well, First of all, I, I think uh, it's important to underline that I think the uh, Chinese intervention um, in this kind of infrastructure is no different by um, other actors' intervention. So I don't want to, you know, um, focus on Chinese kind of uh, uniqueness. Uh, this kind of project, uh, I mean, the, the, my research stem from a perspective of like the initial hypothesis of investigating Chinese-led green finance, but then, you know, research show that infrastructure are then the result of like multiple um, uh, agreements and and uh, um, investments from multiple actors. Uh, so I, I I didn't really show that there was a set downs from the community. I show how like that particular uh, kind of uh, restructuring of like an old hydrodrome through this uh, um, solar floating project, which is a really ambitious project that has been launched in Thailand and China has been a key part of it as kind of renewed older protest, so to speak. Um, and uh, um, I think now, um, as we were discussing at the beginning of this seminar, as from Sharon's introduction, the fact that green finance is gaining momentum in the region, there is a lot of debate going on. Uh, I've seen um, debate around how to build uh, green taxonomies uh, for Southeast Asian countries. Um, and I've seen how some NGO, like for instance, in, in Thailand, Fair Finance is very active, uh, which works in, in tandem with international rivers, uh, are uh, making the effort of, you know, um, kind of issuing their own taxonomy, uh, which is, if you want to maybe call it as, as, as a bottom-up taxonomy, which, which also include uh, um, some um, 
a local uh, knowledge no? in, in the building of this uh, uh, green taxonomy, green investments that are recipes for energy transition. And as a recipe for energy transition, it's really important that they include voices on the ground, as we were, as Prapimpan was rightly pointing before, climate change is a an existential issues, it cannot be easily fixed uh, top down um, with just uh, uh, money, so to speak, intervention. And, and it's very important to include uh, local uh, knowledge and, and, and practices from local communities that really know uh, the challenges of their territories better than anyone else. Thanks. I'm very interested in this issue of taxonomies. Um, and actually, in the many developing taxonomies across the region, um, from uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, even Indonesia also has a taxonomy hijau that's under development. But many of these taxonomies are not um, mandatory, so to speak. They are just recommendations um, to, you know, the companies that are seeking to invest in those countries, right? Then how then do you see the, the effects uh, of these taxonomies in guiding the kind of investment decisions uh, into the country if it still remains to be quite voluntary in nature? And how, how have you seen um, the Chinese taxonomy, for instance, in guiding their own Chinese uh, private investments in, outside of China? Mm -hmm. So the Chinese technology, technology as uh, taxonomy, as I say uh, at the beginning, is one of the first to to be developed and to develop, and is uh, and has been uh, you know giving guidelines uh, in uh, um, developing. Uh, it has been in a way successful as you know has been shown from some data to uh guide domestic uh investment uh within china uh, towards renewable technology it's all been all been challenges challenge in the last few years because of the covid crisis and you know it's it's very hard to to get an overview picture of what were the result of those investments, but there were guidelines and for intra-bank, you know, loans and directed to renewable energy project, China has been extremely active uh, um, with their own green bonds portfolio. In fact, it's one of the countries that has issued most green bonds. Um, and related to your previous question on the developing of other taxonomy in Southeast Asia, yes, they are voluntary uh, guidelines, but my point was referring to the fact that, you know, given that most countries will have to uh, engage in energy transition, this is a starting point. And from this starting point, there could be develop a dialectical kind of uh, um, efforts to include voices that are uh, institutionally out of the discourse. This is what I've shown by just exploring a single case, right? Uh, it's very difficult to generalize. Um, Yes, but there are a lot of challenges and, and they are not mandatory so far and, and taxonomies are very complex. Uh, classification of investment <laughs> that very often, you know, reflect also vested interests in some countries. So, yeah. So at some point, do you see a possibility of harmonization of the classifications, for instance, or of the principles and standards in taxonomies? I think there are certain, I think this is a deeply, uh, I mean, existential issue in the sense that how do we translate uh, um, something as complex as 
and universal as climate risk into specific local contexts. So <laughs> this is something that should really be um, discussed uh, uh, at a global level. I think we should have like clear regulation on on one hand, uh, how to uh, build together infrastructure uh, for energy transition, but also how to include local population in the in decision making. Because as I was saying before, local context and indigenous knowledge even so in some con is, is key to then really um, provide and determine effective policies at a local level. Thank you so much. Um, I want to move on to the many questions that have actually come in. Um, there's an, a question for Dr. Siwage um, about the regarding the draft law on renewable energy. Do you think this draft law will only focus on renewable energy, but will or will it also cover new sources such as nuclear, coal gasification, and other new or high value fossil based sources? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Max. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Max is our former visiting fellow. He's actually an energy expert, and I believe that he he knows more about the, the draft of the renewable energy law. So I haven't really uh, seen the draft yet, but I think uh, this uh, renewable energy will intersect with other sector, uh, even uh, like the fossil fuel or oil and gas sector and uh, other other related sector. So if we uh, if the government only focus only on renewable energy, then it may uh, have uh, its own challenge when it comes to the implementation. So uh, ideally, this uh, renewable energy law has to be uh, harmonized with other laws uh, uh, related to the mining sector, uh, related to the oil and gas sector, related to the industry in uh, industry and other sector transportation. So, uh, yeah, I think if we, we only focus on just renewable energy, then uh, there will be a, a problem later on. Thank you. I, I, I will direct all the Indonesia questions to Dr. Siwa gave first. Um, this is a question from Joy asking uh, whether you have any views on the possible impact of the coming elections in Indonesia on the energy transition plans. I'm also curious to know whether um, in Indonesia these sorts of discussions will, will make its way into campaign promises or not. Yeah, I think uh, the renewable energy law will be the uh, kind of the uh, game changer. So if the current government managed to pass this renewable energy law within the this uh, period before the new government come in, then we may have some optimism that the new government will continue uh, whatever the uh, commitment that the current government has already uh, initiated. So, yeah, uh, we we hope that this renewable energy law will be uh, passed as soon as possible, so that the new government will continue the, with the uh, implementation. But yeah, again, uh, the uh, political commitment is important. This is a long-term goals, and uh, the law itself will not work without. Uh, the derivative regulation from the minister and director general uh, to implement the uh, the law. So yeah, I think it's a long process, and uh, we we will wait uh, until uh, yeah until there's a yeah the, the law has been passed by the the government and the parliament. Mm. Another Indonesia-related question comes from Amy Chu of Nikkei. Uh, she wants to know whether Indonesia's huge nickel mining industry, which relies on coal-fired power plants, and I believe you mentioned that there's an exception where the processing of critical minerals, there'll be an ex exception to use coal-fired power plants. Uh, will it make it difficult for Indonesia to transition to RE? And yes. also bearing in mind that um, nickel, nickel as a critical mineral is is critical to the effort to, uh, you know, 
produce, for Indonesia to produce your own electric vehicles and to kind of grow the whole EV ecosystem? Yes, uh, this is uh, the good question. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, we have a mixed feelings about the government uh, direction, a policy direction, uh, given like uh, the, the presidential regulation uh, saying that it is about the acceleration of energy transition in uh, renewable energy uh, in Indonesia, but at the same time still uh, giving permit for the use of coal-fired power plant for strategic industry in, in nickel industry, mining industry, or so downstream industry. Uh, again, this is related to the other regulation that support the, the development of downstream industry. So my answer will be uh, that uh, uh, I think this is related to the previous answer uh, that renewable energy law is not uh, enough because it has to be linked with other law uh, of existing law in Indonesia on the mining and oil and gas and other uh, industry, downstream uh, industry. Uh, without this harmonization of the regulation and law, then uh, maybe it will be difficult to see the significant progress in the renewable energy development. So yeah, mining is a, a showcase of how, how can Indonesia actually implement this uh, renewable energy uh, program. Yeah, there are so many mo moving parts to the entire uh, green transition piece. Um, I'll just take one last question before we end the, sem the webinar, and it's a question from Kun Apichai Sunchinda, directed to both Dr. Siwage and Dr. Papin Pan, uh, regarding the energy sectors in both Thailand and Indonesia, uh, which are controlled by monopolies and vested interests. And also, may I add, both countries um, do give a large amount of, of fuel subsidies, as uh, Dr. Wagi mentioned in his presentation. Are there any views? Do you have any views or, or, to, or prospects to share on how to address uh, these sorts of obstacles to achieve a, a just transition in the energy sector, both for Indonesia and Thailand and as well for the whole of the ASEAN region? Should, should I start? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think for uh, the case of Indonesia, I think uh, it involving the monopolies and vested interests are important uh, because uh, without involving them, then there will be a uh, kind of a significant opposition and difficult to make progress. So if we uh, include this uh, monopolies and uh, vested interests into the uh, renewable energy or energy transition program, then there is a chance that they may support or also may not support the, the, the program. But at least there's a, uh, the possibility that we, uh, we reduce the opposition. Uh, but the problem is how to incentivize these uh, monopolies and uh, vested interests to, to actually support the green energy uh, program. Yeah, because it actually will take away some of their uh, or uh, uh, what is that, uh, revenue or uh, profit or whatever their, uh, uh, the, the cake that they, they, they've already enjoyed for so many years and now they have to sacrifice that and uh, bring to, uh, yeah, to uh, other players to also benefit from the, the, the available uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, cake. So I think, yeah, that's a, uh, a tough question how we include this uh, vested interest and monopolies into the the whole the uh, the, the whole program mm. okay so i think um i'm a bit less nice than dr sibage when it comes to um, um monopolies um, but I think this is a, a problem that um, not only Thailand and Indonesia have had to face, but um, there are a lot of vested interests like in, in other countries as well around the world. And, um, you know, in a way, I kind of tried to talk a little bit about this in the introduction of my presentation, that ultimately the just energy transition is um, a political, fundamentally a political issue. And I think that... Um, 
it's going to be very difficult, but we're going to have to try to develop a strong and progressive green civil society groups and, and political movements in, in both countries and, and in the region that would um, try to counterbalance the, the power of these vested interests and um, you know, put pressure on the governments to promote policies and, and regulations that will support um, just transition. But of course, I mean, like the um, the the progress in in domestic politics can be quite slow. So I think another thing we can do is that um, to uh, to support um, transnational civil society networks that will put pressure on uh, multilateral banks and also um, you know uh, to to try to encourage other major powers to perhaps make a pact. Um, to stop funding um, fossil fuel projects in, in the region, for example. So that is my answer. And I guess um, another point I, I haven't made here, and it's actually related to Sharon's um, latest article, I think, about obstacles to decarbonization in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, I really like the point you made about the um, the lack of political leadership in, in, the, in the countries in the region. And I think we we do need um, strong political leaderships that will you know um, who you know leaders who are willing to do what needs to be done um, you know in in the long term and try to bring the electorates with them rather than you know running after um, the uh, electoral um, you know the, the votes and and short term interests in in issues that are you know like um, <laughs> yeah, I will not say anymore, but um, I think uh, I get my, my point across. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Actually, there has not been a positive uh, leadership use case in Asia or in Southeast Asia for that matter to show that by taking by um, taking advantage of the first mover, you know, you use your first mover advantage in a climate transition, you could actually uh, bring longer term benefits to your country. In instead, everyone is quite fixated on the short-term pain of transitioning. So one, one of the clearest short-term pains and also evidenced by Dr. Siwagi's survey is that the people are not willing to give up uh, the fossil fuel subsidies. But in actual fact, if th there were a greater move towards a liberalization of the energy sectors, uh, in, because you cannot, like Dr. Siwagi said, right, you cannot take away the cake that they've been enjoying, the monopolies have been enjoying for a long time. Um, so instead of taking away the cake, you have to enlarge that cake. And to enlarge it, maybe one way is to liberalize uh, the sector so that more uh, it can become more diversified and more players can go into the sector to offer a greater array of choices uh, for the consumers and then eventually move the subsidies. It just doesn't make sense why you're subsidizing fossil fuel when you should be subsidizing RE to incentivize people to use RE, choose RE over, uh, over fossil. But unfortunately, in so far, you know, in Asia, there hasn't been a good use case, although there are other uh, leadership cases uh, in, in the world, for instance, Costa Rica's um, example, where they transitioned uh, into an ecotourism hub. They've also uh, converted to a usage of uh, RE, and they've become a kind of a, a leader in the Latin American countries showing that um, by accelerating a transition, it can actually be beneficial uh, for their development and for their economies. Um, so anyway, I, I think we have to end here. We've run over time. Thank you so much for your time and um, to our audience also for engaging so actively. I feel that uh, we have only scratched the surface on this topic and um, I think over the very many years ahead, as we continue to talk about transition issues, many of these uh, issues that we've talked about will come a little bit more prominently up to the fore. And to our audience, if you're interested in following ISIS events and publications related to climate issues, do sign up in the link given in the chat so that we can keep you informed. We endeavor to send you a, a newsletter every few months just to let you know that, you know, uh, we are covering a, a couple of issues that are pertinent uh, for this region. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.